This Equipment World video is brought to you by Chevron Dello 600 ADF Ultra Low Ash Diesel Engine Oil. It's time to kick some ash. Hi everyone, welcome back to Equipment World. You're watching The Dirt. I'm your host Brian and today I've got a really exciting interview. I'm excited about it at least. We're talking with Aaron Witt from BuildWit. If you're not familiar with BuildWit, they are a marketing company that focuses on dirt contractors and what they really specialize in is helping dirt contractors tell their story. What do I mean by that? Well, we all kind of know that the dirt industry is kind of hush-hush. We don't like a lot of outsiders on our job sites, and we certainly don't want people prying into things where there might be potential safety hazards. But at the same time, that really limits our exposure to the outside world, which leaves the outside world to make up their own preconceived notions about what it's like to be in the industry. BuildWit actually helps these companies tell their own story instead of the story imposed on them by the outside world. The reason I'm so excited to talk to Aaron is because I feel like we share a lot of the same viewpoints on some of the disconnects that we're seeing in the industry and why the industry is struggling so hard with the manpower issues it is right now. But before we get into that, I want to take a second to tell you about the sponsor of this video, Chevron Lubricants. Protecting your diesel engine and its exhaust after treatment system has traditionally been seen as an either or proposition when it comes to choosing the engine oil that's going to protect your system. And that's exactly why Chevron spent more than a decade of R&D work developing a no compromise formulation. Now I don't have to tell you why a clogged DPF is bad news, but here's the real kick in the pants. 90% of that ash clogging up your DPF and then upping your fuel and maintenance cost? It comes from your engine oil. You might be thinking, why don't they make an engine oil with less ash in it then? You'll be happy to learn that Chevron agrees with you. They've developed a new ultra low ash diesel engine oil that is specifically designed to combat DPF ash clogging. Dello 600 ADF with OmniMax technology cuts sulfate ash by 60%, radically reducing the rate of DPF clogging and extending the DPF service life by two and a half times. Before you had to choose between protecting your engine or your after treatment system, now you don't. Dello 600 ADF with OmniMax technology. It's time to kick some ash. Well, Aaron, thanks for being on the show, taking taking time out of your busy day to come and discuss job site dynamics with me. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Brian. I really, really uh, appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I guess my first question, just to kind of establish what you guys do at BuildWit, what are some of the services that you guys offer to contractors? So we started with photography and videos. Um, so we built, you know, from initially taking photos, we built a marketing business. So we do creative work for heavy civil and mining companies across the United States, uh, websites, branding, video projects, photo design work. We'll do anything in that world, uh, all about telling their story to attract the next generation primarily. And then we're also getting more into training and development nowadays. So we're getting into the software world, uh, training world, and there's a lot of exciting changes coming down the road for our business. So as you go out on these job sites, uh, you know, kind of like we were just discussing, one of the things that, that I kind of have developed a passion for is really drawing attention to this kind of generational gap. And since you guys spend a lot of your time actually out on job sites with a lot of these larger contractors, what are some of the trends that you've started to see when it comes to these companies marketing for employees versus the traditional sense of marketing for new work? Most of the companies we work with have never really done any kind of marketing before. Um, everything's been word of mouth. All their business development has been pretty simple word of mouth or just low bid, DOT, public work. They've never had to market anything about their companies. So it'll be a billion dollar company, sometimes without even a website. It's it's that simple. Uh, gotta love they the reach out world. To, <laughs> it's <laughs> gotta love it. I mean, it's been good for us. Um, so these, these companies though, they're, they're starting to recognize that they need to put themselves out there, uh, not from a get work perspective, but from a internal culture communication perspective and from a hiring recruitment perspective. Um, so it's, you know, the companies we work with, it's typically when it, they're either younger companies started within the past five to 10 years that have grown pretty substantially and are continuing to grow or it's companies that are 100 years old just passed off to the fourth generation 
And it's whenever that younger generation comes into the mix and says, Hey, we probably need to put ourselves out there a little bit more because what we're doing, this whole word of mouth thing, it's just not working as well as it used to. So sure. It got us here, but it's not going to get us into the future. So that's why all these companies reach out is, um, uh, they've never really told their story before. Some of them aren't all that excited to put themselves out there, but there's such pressure now from a people perspective that they don't really have a choice anymore. And so when it comes to, I noticed, and, and what I love about what you guys do is it, it is about telling the company's story. Um, but ultimately, what is what is the goal? What is the motivator behind that? Both for you guys as a company, as a consultant, um, and then for the company itself, is it ultimately geared towards getting more work and telling that story from that perspective? Or is the industry really starting to recognize the the issues with getting people in the door? The industry is starting to wake up to it for sure. I've noticed even the past like 90 days, there's been a, a, a significant increase in pressure and in urgency from a hiring standpoint. Um, it, companies for the first time ever are, they're not bidding work right now sometimes because they have enough backlog and they can't keep bidding work. Um, some companies are missing deadlines right now because they can't staff projects adequately. There's DOTs not letting billions of dollars of work as it's, as we speak, because they're not confident the projects can be get, can get done on their schedule that they have projected. Uh, and then you have the government saying, we're going to go throw another few trillion dollars at, at the problem. And it's like, there's no one to build the trillions of dollars that work they're talking about. So I don't know what's going to happen there. So all these companies are starting to feel the pressure. I believe companies, everybody's fat, dumb, and happy right now. All these companies are very successful. They're making more cash uh, than, than ever before right now. This past quarter was probably their best quarter in history. This year is going to be their best year in history for the most part in the infrastructure world right now. Um, but they're, so they're, they're kind of fat, dumb, happy, comfortable. They're not going to really change until they start feeling pain and pressure. And they're starting to feel the pain and pressure. They can have all the equipment, in the world, they can have the best processes, they can have the fanciest software, but if they don't have people to execute the work, it's all worth nothing. And they're starting to finally understand that. Um, the group of companies we work with have understood it for a very long time. They're fantastic companies. We're really selective. We, we want to work with companies that already get it. We don't really want to have to beat our head, heads against the wall to try sure. to sell this. And drag uh, them along. <laughs> yeah. So I'm super optimistic. There's a lot of companies that get it, but the industry as a whole still doesn't. So when you're, and, and this is kind of where you have a really unique perspective because you're on the younger side of, you know, I would almost say that you are on the tail end or the, maybe the front end, I should say, of that younger generation coming into the trades. And so I guess not only from your perspective as a younger guy on the job, but also because you get to come in and have this unique perspective as an outsider, as a consultant role, uh, what are some of the disconnects that you're seeing between those older generations and the communication to the younger generations? It's just the older generation did business differently. They learned differently. They communicated differently. It's just now with the advent of technology, these these next generations are evolving so much faster than previous generations did. So we're used to a completely different kind of communication than even my my father is is used to, or especially grandfather's used to. Um, so that's, that's the big thing is, um, the new generation we're we're, you know, we communicate differently. We, we learn differently, which is a big, big, uh, setback in, in the dirt world. We're used to technology. Dirt world doesn't have a whole lot of that. We have more options today than we've ever had before. There's a whole lot of opportunity out there and it's in front of our face all the damn time. We have this immense pressure to go to higher education because that's how the system's designed these days. Future generation or past generations didn't have that. So it's a it's a bunch of different factors. And the reality is the industry needs to catch up or else the industry is going to get left behind. And is that an option? Can the dirt world get left behind? No, because people don't have clean drinking water without us or power without us or roads to go see grandma without us. We need to figure this out. It's not a matter of, I mean, oh no, we don't. Now we'll just pack up shop and go home. Like that that's not an option here. The blue collar world, the dirt world, it's essential. It's completely essential. Food, water, shelter. That's what we do. So we have to figure this out. And the companies that figure this out are the companies that have all the opportunity down the road. It's probably the biggest shift in the industry 
in in decades, the biggest opportunity in the industry in decades is right in front of us. So the companies that figure it out are are going to go do some amazing things. I think I'm very optimistic. I do think it's really interesting. Uh, you know, this this whole it's it's really a paradigm shift because traditionally it has been as a dirt contractor, you're worried about the next recession. You're worried about getting the next job. You're worried about getting. You know, is my bid competitive with my with with my competitor companies? But like you've you've stated, everyone's kind of fat, dumb, and happy right now. There's so much work out there. You're not really having to worry so much about all of these traditional issues that you've had. But companies are still not. I, I would say the vast majority of companies still haven't woken up to the to the threat that you're going to go out of business here in the next five years. Not because you can't get work. Not because there's some recession. But because you can't hire people because you the way you communicate to your employees the way that you treat your employees the way that you bring in employees and appeal to employees that's all got to change and so many people haven't woken up to that that i think it's going to catch a lot of the industry by surprise here in the next five to ten years it will but therein lies the opportunity i don't i don't blame a lot of these companies for not waking up i used to take it personally like hey guys this is so obvious how don't you get this you're smart but it's like if I've been doing it the same way for 40 years and it's been wildly successful, why would I go change, change right now? Yeah. yeah, why would I go upset the apple cart? And I'm making the most money I've ever made in business over a 40 year period. Why, how am I gonna, I'm not gonna go change my entire right. business because Especially that's just, when it's the younger generation generally that are preaching to them and it's like, you you young guys don't know what you're talking about. Exactly, and and, and so yeah. I don't blame, I don't blame these older companies for not not changing and like I said, they're going to have to feel pain before they change. And either that's going to, you know, the smart, the, the, the forward, I, I don't want to say smart, the forward thinking ones are, are already starting to change. There's going to be a lagging uh, group that is going to start to feel real pain and then adjust. And then there's going to get, there's going to be that last group that's just going to be completely left behind and is just going to dissolve. They're either going to be acquired by other businesses or they just, they dissolve and then everything is market share people's absorbed by those companies that get it. I, it, it only has to, to me, it's only going in one direction. It's only going in one direction. If you don't figure out this people thing, you're not going to have a business, no matter how successful you've been, no matter how big your war chest is, no matter how big your balance sheet is, it's not going to matter if you don't have people. Absolutely, man. It, you totally, this is, this is why I wanted to talk with you because you get it. You totally nailed it. And, and so I guess my next question for you, especially because you are kind of on the forefront of that younger generation is how can some of these contractors, once, once they start to grasp, oh, we really do need to address this manpower issue, how do we connect better with the younger generation? How can we appeal to these kids? And, and I want to talk about college separate here in just a second, but just as a contractor, what could I do in my day-to-day -day business to try to help connect with these guys better? And I just want to establish, you know, I'm a young kid. I'm 26 years old. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing, but I visit arguably more job sites in the industry than really anybody right now. I mean, I, I just did 15 states in 30 days and I'm visiting dredging operations one day, landfills the next day, tunnels the next day, coal mines. I've created the, the, the worldview I have, especially on this industry, based on talking to thousands of people, visiting hundreds of job sites in damn near all 50 states. And it's the same thing across the board. But to, to connect with these people, it really starts with just a caring mindset and just a, a paradigm shift in thinking that it's not my equipment that makes me my money. It's not my processes that make me my money. It's my people that make me my money. And how can I care for my people more? How can I take care of them? How can I train them? How can I invest in them? How can I go above and beyond for them? Because they're the ones that care for me. And so it starts with just that, that shift in thinking. Instead of being so concerned about idle time or being so concerned about production numbers or being so concerned about how much money I just spent on implementing some new software that no one seems to understand. Start about how do I really care for my people more? And you know, if you don't have benefits, stuff like that, pay, start there. But let me tell you, that doesn't get you very far anymore. It's, okay, great. You're taking care of pay. You're taking care of benefits. So is everybody else. So you're, you're now you're on par with all the other industries, but what else, what else do you offer? Why do I, why should I come to work for you? What's that, what's that higher purpose? You know, start and, and 
not only come at it from a, a caring perspective, but start telling that story too. You need to start telling your story. You need to start um, shifting those those negative perceptions in the industry. Start educating people in society about why this industry is so important, why it makes a great career, how it's so impactful. That's how we compete with all these other industries. There's a lot of purpose behind what we do in the dirt world, moving dirt, putting asphalt down, uh, you know, laying pipe. All of that goes to allowing the rest of society to live whatever lives they want to live. That's fantastic. And that's a higher purpose that most of these other industries can't compete with. So let's start telling that story. So if I were a contractor right now, I'd be, I'd be, and, and I'm doing the same thing as a business. I'm doing, I'm practicing all, everything I'm preaching. It's how do I care for my people more so than I ever have before? How do I really take care of my people? If I take care of my people, they take care of me. And then the business will grow because they'll go tell their friends and family and I'll be able to hire whoever I need to hire. And then how do I tell that story? How do I get the word out about this industry? Because it's going to take a lot more than just you and me telling this story. It's going to take everybody in the industry talking about it to actually create any significant change whatsoever. We need to go create an entire movement. We need to change the perception of an entire society on an entire industry. That's a lot of work and it's going to take us all to make that a reality. Well, and that's kind of where I was ultimately going to go with this. You kind of, you kind of beat me there, but uh, the, the, the manpower issue that we're seeing right now goes, goes far beyond just contractors uh, yelling at their employees because that's the way we've always done it. And you just need to suck it up and put a, put on your big boy pants. You know, the problem goes back to the fact, and it really, you know, my generation even suffered from the, you've got to go to college to be successful. That, that was jammed down my throat. You got to be, you, you're going to college. You've got to get that degree because it's automatically going to put you in this higher earning tier. And then we had the crash happen in 2008 and my generation came out of college and went, okay, where's our fat payday that everybody promised us because we went and got our college degrees. And it turns out that you, along with thousands, in fact, if not hundreds of thousands of middle management employees, were all competing for the same job. And so now instead of me going and getting a $60,000 a year job right out of college, instead it's, no, we want you to have 10 years of experience in management for this entry level job that we're going to pay 45,000 for. And it's like, that's not how this works. Like you told us that we were going to be successful. And instead of after the crash, instead of everyone kind of reshaping the way they thought about secondary education, instead everyone just kind of doubled down and it was like full steam ahead. And so I guess my question would be, how do we collectively start getting into these high schools and really start changing that mentality that the trades aren't something you kind of go into when you can't do school? If, you know, if you're not cut out for school, you go into the trades. That's the way it's traditionally been. How do we change that? You know, like I said, it comes a lot of that comes down to storytelling. So a lot of it, you know, first, again, you need to make it a great industry to work for. Yeah, we have a lot of problems as an industry. It's really cool. We get a lot of really cool equipment. We get to do some awesome jobs. We have an immense sense of pride and purpose in what we do. But also, um, I don't know, we're, we're number one by industry for suicides, for example. Which that's, that's not a very well-known statistic. There's more people that die by suicide than die by safety accidents, than die by accidents in the industry. Interesting. I did not know and that. Most people don't. Yeah. So there's, there's problems there that we need to figure out. So one, you know, if you want to go change the world, and this is, uh, shoot, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on, on who, who talks about this, uh, Jordan Peterson. If you want to go change the whole world, but you have, you know, dishes in your sink, how, why don't you start with your dishes in the sink? I think our industry's dishes in the sink are, let's focus on our companies and how we can make them great places to work, how we can take care of our people, how we can make them places that everybody's proud to work for and wants to talk about it. And if you make it something that everybody's proud to do, wants to talk about it, and then you start telling those stories online in a digital world, where the kids are, go where the kids are, it starts to just feed itself. You start to change that narrative. But we've let, we've let everybody else tell our story and they've been able to twist it and turn it however they want. And instead, now we need to focus on let's do our dishes and then let's go get the word out. And social media is a great tool for that. I'm asked all the time, like, do you go to colleges or, or high schools and this and that? And I say, no, I don't. I don't need to. I, have, I, I can reach millions of people every single week, month on my phone. 
And where are kids these days? They're on their phones. I want to be there too. And the industry should be there too. And it's not very hard to compete. It's not like we're, it's not like we're lawyers and it's not like, well, how do I make an exciting video about a, a lawyer? I don't know. Yeah. Here's some legal documents. Check them out. Right. kids. They're super cool. So awesome. Work right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but a dozer hogging, hogging material or a, a grader laying down some grade or an excavator lane. That's cool. That's super cool. We just need to get the story out there. So I think, I think step one is let's focus on us before we start worrying about everybody else. And then step two is we need to get the word out. We need to get, we need to tell our story. We need to be vulnerable and, and, and we need to, we need to trust people within our business to tell that story. A lot of these businesses want to control everything and think that they have, they're the only ones with access to their sites. It's like, Hey, anybody with a phone can post a picture of your site any day of the week. So instead of worrying about who can post a picture, maybe worry about having a buttoned up safety program, having people that take pride in what they do so that anybody at any time can take a picture of your job site and you don't have to worry about it. And call me naive, call me some stupid kid, but those are the companies we work with and it seems to be working out pretty well for them. I mean, but, but again, what do I know? You know, it is interesting. One of the one of the things that really, in my opinion, has plagued this industry all along, and I do think this is one of the biggest contributing factors to that generational gap, is this machismo that everyone feels they need to have on the job site. Like we're we're like the manliest of manly men, and heaven forbid you show any sort of like grace to someone who screws up on a job site. Like, no, you need to come fly. Everyone on the job site knows. Foreman comes flying up with dust ripping behind that white truck. The door flies open and you get just an, a complete butt chewing for five minutes before he disappears down the road. Like heaven forbid you actually treat that as a teachable moment. And, and I don't know why that is so ingrained into this industry that that's how you handle situations. You just scream and yell. And it's up until this point, that's actually... It's, as you were kind of talking it there, I was thinking through, it's kind of interesting because the older generations, we kind of wear that as a badge of honor. Like, hey, we made it. We got our asses chewed that whole time. We made it. We stuck it out. And here we are. And we've got this to show for it. And that disconnect happens with the younger generation who's coming in and they go, you don't need to talk to me that way. And I'm not going to sit here and let you talk to me that way. And, and believe it or not, that's the correct attitude. But this industry doesn't see it that way. They don't see it that way because that's how they learned. And that the technology has really thrown a loop in everything because we have way more technology than the last generation did. And we're starting to outpace by by a long shot human psychology and, and evolution and generational change. So the, the reality is this generation learns way differently than the last generation did. And yes. sure, the last generation learned differently than the previous generation, but the gap was a lot smaller compared to yeah. what it is today. And I think that's the big problem. And, and because there, it's a very proud industry, people think that because I got yelled and screamed at, I need to do the same thing. You should too. Yeah, I, sh I should too. And because, you know, I earned my way, they need to earn theirs. And I don't think we go soft on anybody. This is a hard industry. This is not for everybody. I'm the first one to say that. It's tough. It's hard. It's dirty. There's long hours. You're away from home. You work weird hours a lot of times. You're doing phys physically demanding work. There's a lot of realities to this industry that we need to be honest about. That's all what makes it great. So it builds that pride. But at the same time, and that and that's fine. There's standards that need to be met, and that's okay. We need to be hard on people. We need to enforce high standards. We need to and make sure everybody can actually do the work. That's cool. But also we need to accept that people just learn differently. And so it's like, you know, the best example I have right now, it happened Sunday. I rolled my skid steer. I, I save up, you know, 10 years work, work as hard as I can to go buy myself a machine just for fun. I'm not a contractor, but I want a skid steer and you can, Hey, Caterpillar will sell them to anybody. So I buy a skid steer. I put it on its roof. Did I intend to put it on its roof? No, no. Was I doing but something stupid? But you won't stupid? do it again. No, I know. <laughs> I won't do it again. I was wearing my seatbelt. I just popped the door open, walked out, not a scratch on me. I was good to go. And yet you have these people online and there's just a few of them. I have hundreds of people saying, thanks for posting this. We're going to actually talk about this at today's safety safety meeting, or I've been there too. Best, best, but one of the best mistakes I've ever made. And I haven't done it since, you know, that's what made me a great operator. So you have all these people yeah. thanking and saying, thank you for sharing this reality. But then you have the other people saying, you know, if that was if that was my site, you'd be drug tested and fired. It's like, 
what does that do? Why? What yeah, What did why? you just accomplish? Because was I being deliberately was I being deliberately reckless? No, I wasn't. I was doing my best. And and instead, if I was in that situation, I'd be looking at it like I screwed up as a leader here. Because clearly, whoever was in the skid steer that just put it put it on its roof doesn't have the training they need. I made a rookie mistake. I backed down a slope that was a little too steep with the bucket a little too high. Anybody knows that you're going to end up on your roof if you do that. Had I known, had I been trained effectively, I wouldn't have made that mistake. And that it w- I would have saved myself the embarrassment. But now that, that I've made the mistake, I'm not going to do it again. But as a leader, if there's a failure like that on my site, I'm going to be looking at it like, hey, I need to train more effectively here because clearly some of these guys are not where they need to be to be operating this equipment effectively. And then we're going to make it a teaching moment for that individual, the rest of the team, future people coming into the business. And then I'm also going to give that operator grace because that operator is probably beating himself up enough. I don't think I need to go over there and beat him up anymore. His ego just took one hell of a hit. He's good to go. And then by showing that kind of grace, I'm showing, hey, we're all human here. We make mistakes, man. Is everybody safe? Is everybody okay? Cool. Let's learn from this. And then by, by me showing me that grace, that individual, they're going to work so much harder for me. They're going to follow Absolutely. me wherever I go. They're going to take care of that business way beyond they would have, way beyond how they would have taken care of it before. And that plays into that whole machismo attitude that we were just talking about. Like, I don't know why in this industry that's perceived as weakness. Like if I go soft on this guy because I don't drug test him and fire him, that's weakness. Like, no, like how it, this, this industry has traditionally almost been like a meat grinder in the sense that we're just going to churn through people. And traditionally you've been able to do that because we haven't had the labor shortage that we've had in these recent years, but people haven't realized that you've ground through all the meat. There is no more meat coming into the top of the grinder. And so you don't have the ability to just churn through people like you did traditionally. And so things have to change. And one of those, you know, main things that I always keep coming back to with, with all of the contractors that I come into contact with and and all of these situations that I witness is this, this industry has got to learn how to show grace because we can't continue to just churn through people the way we have. I think we'll figure it out one way or another. Um, you know, it, it's a very macho industry. Of course, people act like that. It's it's a very primal world. You know, you want to uh, human psychology, human nature. The strongest are the ones that survive. We're the apes. This, <laughs> we're the we're the apes, and this is a physical world. So you want to sure. be that big, big, tough guy. But but frankly, even in previous generations, the best operators I know, the best foremen I know, superintendents I know. The most successful company owners I know, and I've met a lot of very, very, very successful company owners at this point in time. They're not the big tough guys. Yeah, they're not the big tough guys. They're kind. They have they have very high standards, and sometimes they'll let you know that. But they really care, and they don't need to go prove themselves. They don't tell people that they're they're wrong or whatever it may be. They 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 really care for people, and so even in previous like there, it's this isn't new. The most successful people I've met from the previous generations are still like this. It's still this common thread. Uh, and they've been able to go against the grain. And now that's only becoming more and more valuable. But the industry is going to figure it out one way or another. And I know I'm on the right side of history. I know I'm working with the companies that are on the right side of history. And if companies want to come along and let's go for a ride and let's go make the dirt world a better place together, cool. If not, cool. Like, you know, maybe I'm totally wrong. And maybe we compare notes and wow, you are right. We, we should have just been completely, we shouldn't have cared for people. That was the totally wrong approach. But I'm making a pretty safe bet here that I think caring for people is how we're going to figure this thing out uh, going forward. 100%. And, and on that note, I don't want to go any further because we're just going to unpack more cans of worms and we're going to go even deeper into this. So that, I mean, that... 100% nails. Do you have any final thoughts that you want to share outside of what we talked about? No, I, I, I can unpack a lot of cans of worms. So, Oh no, I I'm think, with uh, you. We, I could spend the afternoon with you, uh, bitching about the trades and, and how we could improve, but I think this is a good start. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all I do on my podcast. It's just, it's just us complaining. Yeah, there you go. Well, I do again, appreciate your time. I appreciate your insight on all this. I appreciate you having me. 
So I do want to thank Aaron again for his time. I know he's super busy, but I really felt like that was a very insightful interview. Uh, like Aaron discussed, he has been around the country to thousands of job sites with multiple contractors. And so he's able to, while he doesn't have the on the ground dirt experience that a lot of us do in the industry, he's able to get an outsider's perspective on some of the problems that we're facing in the industry. So I hope some of this has been helpful. I hope maybe this helps you as a contractor think about how you're running your company and how you might want to shift some of your personal paradigms on how you think about employees and the industry in general. And I really do hope this information helps your business move forward in a really healthy way so that you can continue to be profitable in the future. So with that being said, Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you guys on the next episode of The Dirt.